welcome back to today's vlog. It's been a while since I last filmed. I think the last vlogs that I posted were from Normandy because since I've come back, I've been really busy and quite a lot's happened. It's been my birthday. I had my 21st birthday, hence why there's lots of birthday cards on the mantelpiece behind me. And it was really lovely. I went out for afternoon tea with my mum and my sister. And then um, I went out for dinner with my family as well. And it was a really lovely day and I feel old now, but I'm going to put that aside. Today I've got a fun trip planned. I'm going to go to Deerham Park because the weather's quite nice and I finished work for three weeks and because I'm going to take some break, I'm going to go on holiday with my family. Um, but today I thought it'd be nice to just have a relaxed day because I've been working every day and I think a bit of time off is just what I needed. And I'm going to go and read and walk around the grounds and show you the property because it's a really beautiful property, a classic Georgian manor house. So I'm sure you're going to love it. And I can't wait to take you there. So I've made it to Durham Park and I'm walking down the property. It's quite a long winding path to get down all the way down the hill. Um, but I'm making my way down and it's nice weather, so it's quite a pleasant walk. Located in South Gloucestershire and surrounded by an ancient deer park, Durham Park comprises of a Baroque English country house, orangery, stable block and parish church which are all Grade 1 listed. Since the Doomsday Book of 1086, there have been records of the Manor of Durham, a name which is derived from the Anglo-Saxon word that means an enclosure for deer. The house that we see today was built between 1692 to 1704 for William Blathwaite, with the east façade being designed by William Tallman, the same architect who designed Chatsworth House. William Blathwaite was secretary at war to William III, as well as a prominent Whig politician who sat in the House of Commons and who established the War Office as a department of the British government. He was also influential in overseeing the English colonies of North America. It is thanks to his royal connections and prominent political position that he was able to construct Deerham Park to house his collection of Dutch art, including paintings by the old masters and Delftware, and decorate the manor with sumptuous fabrics and furniture. His new house only increased his professional standing, and his colleagues from North America supplied him with luxury walnut and cedar timber to construct the stairs and panelling. His travels also enabled him to buy Carrara marble tiles and Indian silks. William Blathwaite had two sons who were fittingly raised as English gentlemen. The older brother, also called William, inherited the estate but was a slow learner and struggled socially, so his life was mainly devoted to simply managing the estate. In contrast, the younger brother, John, was intelligent and a musical prodigy, and he played with famous composers in Rome, as well as founding an opera company with Handel. The house was passed down within the same family all the way until 1956, and during World War II they even welcomed child evacuees. It wasn't until 1961 that the property and its grounds were donated to the National Trust. So I've just come out of the house and it was really good because before when I came, um, none of the upstairs was accessible to the public, but now that they've renovated it, they've opened it up, but then in contrast, some of the downstairs rooms were closed because they're um, currently under renovation. So it's quite cool to see a house that's in the process of being renovated and to observe their progress and how much work a house like this takes. Durham Park has seen a recent rise to fame thanks to its popularity as a film location. It is perhaps best known as George Warleggan's house in the series Poldark, and also as Sanderton House, home to Lady Denham in the series Sanderton, based on Jane Austen's unfinished novel of the same name. The house has also appeared in several scenes of Doctor Who and The Crimson Field, amongst other series and films. The Anglican Parish Church of St Peter is located beside the house and was built during the 13th century. It includes a collection of tombs and memorials dedicated to previous owners of the house. It is not owned by the National Trust, but is well worth exploring if you visit the estate.
good time walking around Durham Park. It's such a beautiful National Trust property and like I said there's a lot that changed because some of the rooms that were previously closed were open and others are now undergoing re um, renovation because they're slowly working through the property. Um, so it's really cool as an architecture student to walk around and to go there regularly since it's so close and see the progress, see the changes as they're going along. So I really enjoyed it and yes it's the next day and Today I'm going to be baking a halka. A halka is basically like a Polish brioche and it's really, really delicious. I've got a really good recipe that's like my go-to recipe if I want something quick and delicious. And it's basically um, a loaf that's plated and it's got a little crumble on top and oh my gosh, it's so good. So I'm going to share the recipe with you because I feel like you need to try it out. And I think lots of people are put off trying to make a homemade brioche because it uses yeast and it's... Um, a bit like a bread and lots of people think that breads are difficult, they take so much time to make but this recipe is really easy and it's actually quite quick, it's the kind of thing that you can um, you can put the dough, you know, throw it into the mixer in the morning, let it sit while you're getting yourself ready or I don't know, doing something else, then come back to put it in the oven and it's ready, so it's really easy, <laughs> I'll show you how I do it and yes, I can't wait to get started because <laughs> I haven't made this in quite a long time actually because while I was in Paris, I didn't really bake that much because I was trying out all the bakeries there so I didn't have a need to bake and I was alone so it's kind of like, <laughs> why would you bake if you're by yourself? But now that I'm with my family again and I am no longer in Paris, I've been baking a lot more again. So I think it's been like a year since I've actually used this recipe so fingers crossed it'll turn out well. I'm sure it will because it always turns out great. And yes, I'll show you how I do it. So for this recipe, you need 500 grams of plain white flour, 200 milliliters of milk, 50 grams of butter, 50 grams of sugar, two eggs, and 30 grams of fresh yeast, which I have already prepared. So to start, you get your milk and you put it into a pan and heat it until it's lukewarm because you're going to dissolve your yeast straight into this. So I'll go ahead and pour it into the pan, like so. And you heat that on a low heat until the milk is warm to the touch, so lukewarm, because you don't want to heat it too much because if it's boiling hot, then it will kill the yeast. So just until when you put your finger in, it's warm, then you know it's ready. Okay, that heated really quickly, so it's already warm to the touch, so I'm going to put it um, back into the jug so it doesn't get too hot. And now I'm going to add in the fresh yeast um, by crumbling, crumbling the yeast into small pieces with my fingers just to make sure that it dissolves easily, like so. And now using my fingers I'm going to mix the yeast into the milk. And I say using my fingers because in the past when I've tried to use a spoon or something like that, um, it's not properly dissolved it, so I'll just... Um, twirl my fingers around in the milk and I can feel the lumps of yeast in that way, I can feel to make sure it's all properly dissolved and um, so I'll do that until it's all dissolved. So now what I'm going to do is melt the butter because the butter needs to be melted and then cooled and um, to be used as a liquid. So I'll melt it now to make sure that it cools in time to carry on the recipe. So I have my butter here and I'll put it into a pan and put that onto the heat. I put it on a bit of a low heat just to make sure it doesn't burn because I feel like burnt butter is so disgusting and um, it will ruin the recipe. So I'll co continually stir that just to avoid burning and I will check in with you once it's done. So now that the butter has completely melted I'm going to start um, with the next step of the recipe which is to put the milk dissolved with yeast into the mixer and I've prepared the um, KitchenAid bowl with the dough hook um, to mix the dough. So I'll pour that in. Along with the sugar, which has a lump in it. And I'll start putting in the flour bit by bit and then mix that together in the KitchenAid. Now I've been mixed 
mixing the dough while slowly adding in the flour and I think I've added in about half of the flour and as you can see it's starting to come together as a dough. So since it's becoming quite dry, I'm now going to add the eggs and the butter. So I'm going to crack the eggs into a jug and whisk them just to bring them into a smooth consistency, into a liquid, and then I'll put them in and add the cooled butter. The eggs start to become a little bit of a paler colour and it's um, all mixed together. That means they're ready and you can add them in. And the butter is also ready now because I basically put this into a basin of cold water just to make sure it's cooled down properly. And this is um, cool now so I'll pour that in as well. And now I'm going to carry on mixing. Also, while it's mixing, you're going to keep adding in the flour bit by bit until it's all in there and fully combined. So now you can see that the dough is nice and smooth and everything's combined. Um, and at this point, I'm going to just mix it for 10 minutes just to knead the dough and make sure that it's all properly combined and just get the yeast worked up a bit. Okay, now that the dough has been kneading for 10 minutes, um, what I've done is I've grabbed a large bowl, which I have buttered, so I just grabbed some butter with my fingers and smeared it all around the inside of the bowl because actually it might be a little bit large, but it's better larger than too small. And um, the dough needs to be put in here and left to sit for one to two hours. I would always recommend that the longer the better because if I leave it to um, sit for longer, then I find that the bread just ends up better. So I'm going to leave it for two hours. Um, so I'm going to take it out of the KitchenAid. And put it into the bowl. Um, and I can feel that this dough is really fluffy and lovely. It smells so good as well. I really miss making these breads because I used to make them all the time and have them for breakfast. So I'm really looking forward to it being ready. But it just smells really good, it's nice and smooth and it should be a little bit sticky. I find that whenever I make it, it always ends up being a bit of a stickier dough. Um, but that's fine, as long as it's not too sticky. Like you can kind of show you a bit of the dough so you can see the consistency. But it's lovely, it's got um, bubbles running through it and it's a little bit sticky. So it's sticking to my fingers a bit but it's still um, like malleable and it's not too sticky. I think you know what I mean. Like I can touch it without my fingers completely being stuck to it. But it's nice and soft and smooth and it smells incredible. <laughs> I don't know about you, but bakeries and like baking bread, that's one of my favourite smells in the world. I love it so much. So now I've just grabbed a clean kitchen towel and cover the bowl with a kitchen towel just to stop um, the dough from drying out. And then leave it for two hours. <laughs> um, so yes, this re recipe requires a bit of patience, but like I said, you can just find something else to get on with in the meantime. I'm probably going to start editing this vlog. <laughs> um, but yes, I'll come back and check on it in two hours' time. So now the two hours are up and it's time to check my dough, see how it's risen. Oh my gosh, okay, I told you that I thought this bowl was a bit oversized because I didn't think it would grow all the way to the top, but it literally did. It's so... It surprised me actually how much it's risen. It's really good. It's a good sign. It means that the dough will bake well in the oven. So the next step is to get some flour and flour the surface and put the dough onto the counter. So I'll just grab some flour and shake it onto the counter like so, so it doesn't stick. I'm just kind of roughly spreading it out. Now I will tip this dough out, lovely, and because it was buttered it didn't stick to the bowl. Okay, so now the next step is to um, pull the dough out into a kind of rectangular shape and divide it into three because this is the point where I'm going to plait the dough. So, um, like so, I'm just going to... Using a knife, roughly try to cut it into three pieces. Um, it's, it's kind of hard. 
just because I don't want to defluff the dough too much. Okay, so that's what one of the pieces should look like, just a long <laughs> sausage of dough. And now I'm going to cut this one in half. long and thin pieces of dough. I don't know if you can see that. Put them next to each other and join the three of them together at one end and kind of um, mush the end together so it's um, like one point that divides into three. And now I'm just going to plait it like I would a regular plait. And I'm assuming you know how to plait hair. It's the same thing, but I'll explain it in case someone doesn't know how to. So basically, you start with one of the outer ones, I'm going to start with the left one, and just bring it over into the middle and rearrange the three strands so that the um, one that was on the outside is now on the inside. And then with the opposite side, so because I started with the left, now I'm going to grab the right one, I'll do the same, lift it and put it over and bring it into the middle. Um, and you just repeat this. So bring the left one, then the right one, left one, then the right one, until you've plaited the whole... Um, the whole the length of the day. Now when you get to the end, so you've plaited the whole length of the dough, then you do the same thing. So you grab the three strands and kind of mush them together just to end the loaf. And that gives you one sort of long plait of bread. And look how beautiful it is. So now what I've done is I've prepared a baking tray baking paper. And I'm going to transfer my loaf <laughs> without breaking it onto the tray, there we go, um, I might have to <laughs> make it a bit shorter to make it fit, beautiful, and um, like so, oops, <laughs> and now I'm going to cover this with a, because this table's a bit dirty, um, with a cloth, like I did earlier, and leave it for another 20 minutes, so this is the second rising period, um, and then after that it'll be ready to bake so 20 minutes left of waiting and then I can put it into the oven and um, so at this point you can preheat your oven the oven needs to be preheated to 180 degrees celsius and um, so you can start that now just so that it's heating up while you're waiting for the last 20 minutes while you're waiting for the last 20 minutes, another thing you can do is prepare a crumble to put on top of the halka, which is quite traditional in Poland and which is delicious. Obviously this is optional, it's not necessary for the brioche, but it's really delicious and really easy to make. So what you need to do is in a one to one to one ratio, combine flour, sugar and butter. So I've, I mean, I'm not sure how much I'm going to need, but I've got 30 grams of flour, 30 grams of sugar, 30 grams of butter. And looking at it in the bowl, it looks like that's about how much I want to sprinkle on top of the loaf. And it's really easy. All you do is grab your fingers and mush it together, like making um, a crumble for like apple crumble or um, something like that. And basically, you just mix it together until it's kind of crumbly in texture, a bit like sand. So I will do that now. So this is the kind of consistency that you're looking for, something that is just crumbly, a bit like sand. My mixture actually ended up being a bit too wet, so it wasn't crumbling, it was just sticky. So I just added flour until it reached the desired consistency. So now I'm going to be making the glaze. So I've got one egg yolk, which I put in this jar. And I'm going to add a dash of milk to it. So just a little bit, like so. Um, and I'm going to mix it together and I have one of those weird like brush things because I'm going to brush it over the top of the loaf uh, before I put it into the oven and that will make the crust nice and shiny and golden and just how you want a brioche to look so I just mix it together and basically it should just be a little bit of a paler yellow um, it doesn't really matter so if you don't have milk you can just do egg yolk or if you don't have egg yolk, you can just do milk, but I think it's better with egg yolk in it. 
So the dough has been resting for 20 minutes, so I will take off the cloth and you can see, wow, it has risen so much again um, because this is the second rising time and it is a lot fluffier, a lot larger. <laughs> so now I will spread it with the glaze that I prepared, just kind of all over the dough to make sure it's completely covered and it will look kind of yellow, but um, trust me when it bakes, it'll be lovely and golden. Now the final step before baking is just to add on the crumble. So I'm just going to sprinkle that generously over the top. Like I said, this is a personal preference. You don't have to add the crumble at all, or you can just add a very little bit. I like to add a lot because it's really yummy. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to sprinkle that over the top. And now it is ready to put into the oven. So I'll show you. Oh my God, I had a heart attack then. I thought that was going to drop it. That is what the loaf looks like. And it's very beautiful. And I'm about to put it in the oven. The crumble fell off. Um, and I'll bake it for 30 to 40 minutes. Um, keeping an eye on it because I'm not sure exactly how long it will take, but roughly that time. And once it's golden brown, I will take it out. taken the halka out of the oven it's got a lovely golden brown color it was in for 30 minutes um so like i said 30 to 40 depending on how strong your oven is how fast it will cook but oh my gosh the smell in my house is just incredible at the moment i'm going to let it cool for a little bit before i cut it but oh my gosh it just looks so good and i can't wait Now the time has come to slice the halka. This is what it looks like. And I'm going to cut it. Okay, so this actually turned out so good. Look how fluffy this slice is. I don't know if you can, if it's gonna focus. There you go, it's so soft and fluffy. And it smells amazing. Okay, I'm going to rip a bite of this off. But even the bread just rips so well. It is so fluffy. Mmm. This is like the ultimate comfort food, it's so heavenly. Two thumbs up. I would definitely recommend trying out this recipe if you have time because it doesn't take long and you get the most delicious brioche like ever. Halka is so good. And the crumble just gives it a little extra something because it's crunchy and sweet and buttery. And just basically go and try it because it's so good. So I hope you enjoyed following along with me baking this halka. If you like this video, then please subscribe to my channel to join me on more adventures and to see more delicious recipes. And I will see you next time. Bye.